Hello? Yeah, let's start again. Um, so welcome to the second uh, session. Uh, hope you could uh, have a bit of a breathe outside uh, while we still have the sun here. Um, let's dive into what well, we already did actually uh, before the break, but dive further into uh, scientific um, uh, workflows uh, and hear what scientists have to tell us and how they can provide us with some more help on uh, deciding on, on seeing what is expected of us uh, as a community. Uh, we have three researchers here uh, that I'd like to introduce to you. Uh, I'll introduce them. They will each uh, give us a quick overview of what they are doing and how they are dealing with data. And then uh, the floor is all open to questions I have already here and of course all the questions that you have. So you have the scientists here fire up, I would say. And pick of speech, of course. Um, <laughs> so we, first, uh, we have uh, there uh, on the right for you, uh, Joris van Zundert. He is a researcher and developer in computational and digital humanities at Huygens. Um, he's experienced in computational asset and empirical uh, literary and linguistics research, applying digital and statistical technology. He's a profound advocate of empirical humanities uh, research, uh, evolutionary modeling, iterative development, agile and lean project management. Next to him is uh, Eike de Wever. He's a science officer for the Bi BioFresh data portal at the Royal Belgian Institute of Natural Sciences here in Brussels. As a taxonomic backbone for the project, they are maintaining and extending the freshwater animal diversity assessment database. But he will tell us more about it. The, uh, professor Dirk van der Poel is a professor of marketing, analytics, big data, analytical uh, customer relationship management at Ghent University. Uh, he specializes in customer intelligence and analytical customer relationship manage management, including customer acquisition, customer retention, and cross-up selling. And data mining for him is, a, is an important thing. Uh, he's also the program director of the Master of Marketing Analysis uh, uh, well, since uh, 2000. Um, I give the floor to you. Uh, I start with uh, Joris. Please tell us uh, what uh, you're about and what you're doing. And uh, so maybe you have already some questions for us. Sure. Um, thank you for having me over, first of all. It's very nice to be here. Um, I wrote that myself, actually, that introduction that you, you, you had there. And uh, I'm, I'm quite surprised to hear that back after, I think, a few years now. Because nowadays, I might describe myself a little different. Uh, that doesn't matter. It's a fine introduction. It's just maybe somewhat on the, uh, strong on the, the computational side, maybe. Um, so what I'm doing, I'm, I'm from the Huygens Institute. Actually, somebody uh, made a nice little mistake of putting Belgium as my nationality uh, there, uh, which, which I, I, I'm very happy that it happened because um, I think my roots are finally here, coming from here. Uh, but I really couldn't aspire to, to take the nationality of such a nice people. So I'm actually Dutch. I'm working at the Huygens Institute for the History of the Netherlands. And that is an interesting flock of researchers together uh, because we have in, in all sorts and varieties, we have researchers that are completely, I would say, at the hermeneutic side of things. So people, humanities researchers that are completely focused on interpreting data, interpreting text, and creating new insights on base, on the basis of solid and subtle reasoning. Uh, I'm, on the other hand, could be seen as somewhat of a new Bengal sort of type of research in the humanities, which is all about trying to formalize the data that we're working on. And I guess that might be interesting for uh, the people here in the, in the audience uh, today as well. Uh, so we have been looking into ways of, for example, uh, formalizing the stylistics uh, uh, of literature and literary resources, uh, literary sources, sorry. Um, so f f just to give you one example of what I've been working on is trying to uh, tell apart two different authors 
in a 14th century manuscript, Middle Dutch manuscript, uh, of which it is, the text itself claims that it was written by two authors, but nobody really knows where one author took over from another. And indeed, using uh, statistical means, um, one could say simple word counting, it's slightly more difficult than that, but we can go into that if you're interested. Uh, we were indeed able to tell, to pinpoint uh, the, uh, the, um, the, trans the, the, the transfer from one author to the other author's text. And what is interesting about that is not so much the fact that we could pinpoint it, because that was somewhat known, although it was unsure. But what we also found, uh, which was really rather new to the field, is that the latest author took over from the first author and changed his text. And that we could only certainly tell from taking a more statistical sort of uh, data model view on a tank. So that's that's the kind of research that I'm interested in. And that gets you also into the data modeling aspect within humanities, which is a, I would say, intricate and complex thing that we're still figuring out how to do that. And yes, certainly at some point we will need all the data centers and libraries to help us out with how to store and how to manage and how to exchange that data because that is still a very much a, uh, a search and a quest for us, actually. Um, so that's hopefully uh, enough for me. Yeah, for okay, thank Hi. you very much. Eike? So I'm uh, Eike de Wever. I'm coming from a completely different background. I'm a biologist. And uh, I studied here in, in Ghent University. And I did a PhD on aquatic uh, microbial ecology. And uh, this brought me into contact with, with several types of data. One of them are, are uh, genetic sequence data, for which there is a, a, a very nice repository, which is called GeneBank, uh, which, uh, well, every scientist who's worked with uh, sequences has known ab uh, knows about. On the other hand, I've worked a lot with experimental data where where it's very much each researcher on its own, except, well, if you collaborate on, on this particular experiment, but it's typically a ra rather small group of people working on this data set. And then I've worked um, after my PhD a little bit with uh, um, uh, remote sensing data, with remote se sensing imagery, where I have both uh, worked with satellite data where you have you're just relying on, on the big providers and, and where it's more a matter of uh, them describing what you actually did with this data to, to, to have some metadata on this. And then on, on the other hand, you're working with um, space-borne um, um, uh, imagery where, where, you, where actually the team of people we worked with, they paid for a plane to go, go out to take pictures of a certain area, and and then it's it's also up to the group to to take care of the the storage of, of such data, which have a, well they they're very expensive to to make these pictures, and and they they could be reused for for different purposes. So this there it becomes really important to get a, a decent archiving facility. And now of um, uh, about three years ago, I, I started my job at um, uh, Royal Benz Belgian Institute of Natural Sciences. And uh, for those living in Belgium, it's uh, known as the uh, Dinosaur Museum. And um, it's, it's quite a, a, a big institution. It's, uh, has a, it's among the top ten um, um, natural history museums in terms of uh, the size of, of its uh, collections in the world. And I'm working on an EU project uh, called Biofresh, uh, which is uh, focusing on, on freshwater biodiversity. And we're trying to, to get data together on, on which uh, species occurs where on the planet. And, and for instance, if, if people catch uh, a, a fish in a stream and, and they they would report it, then Biofresh is, is interested in this kind of data to, to get a, a global overview of, of where species occur. 
Um, the big problem there is, and, and this in this job I, I come into contact with data of, uh, every day, and, and the big problem there is that there's like um, this long tail of data where, where individual researchers, they, they go out to, to a pond and to, to, to see what's, what's living there, and, and they do, they, if, if, they're, if you're lucky, they make a publication out of it, this, but sometimes they just don't care, and this data gets lost. In, in the best case, it's in a paper, but it's not, the data is not deposited. In the worst case, it's just going to be lost. It's on their hard drive, what they found there, but it's never going to, to be used. And um, fresh waters are, are really one of the, is, is the environment that's the, under the heaviest threat. The, the uh, biodiversity is, is uh, decreasing in, in, in fresh water at, at rates which are much higher than in the marine and terrestrial environment. And if we want to, to get a, a good idea of, of what is actually going on, why this is the case, what we can do to stop this, what will happen under climate scenarios for different uh, uh, species, we, we need to have a, a, a better um, view on, on, on where species live and under which, which conditions. And by bringing all this data together, and especially th those data in the long tail, um, this would help a lot, uh, but there's still a, l a, a big effort uh, that we need to go through because, well, scientists are just reluctant to make this kind of data available. So that's it for, for me for oh now. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Eike. Hi, I'm Dirk van der Poel, Professor of Marketing Analytics here at Ghent University. got started uh, with my PhD uh, about uh, 20 years ago, sounds scary, um, most of the data we had available was company internal data, so I'm in marketing, so uh, what we do is we analyze marketing data, consumer behavior data, and so we try to figure out uh, how the consumer behaves under certain conditions, and we try from the point of view of the company to optimize uh, how things work. And uh, at that time, we only had internal data. Now, even just internal data is a lot of data uh, in the case of marketing, because as you know, you're all consumers, you go to the supermarket, you scan your loyalty cards to get your points. And what we get out of it, out of the process is lots of data. So what you purchase, more importantly, what you purchase together in one basket. And we, as uh, researchers, we want to understand what's going on in this purchasing process. So even these, let's say, purchasing data is just recording what you purchase is in fact the end result of a whole process that has been going on in your mind, in your social environment. And so, when I started 20 years ago, we only had the end result, the purchase. In the meantime, we, uh, of course, we had the development of the internet and all kinds of, let's say, social media in the meantime. And what made this possible is, in fact, understanding or giving you additional data on what's going on between, let's say, you viewing an ad on TV a commercial on TV, you thinking about a product, should I buy it, shouldn't I buy it, and so on. So the whole thought process is much more documented right now because we also see your information searches on the internet. So as opposed to just having the end result, the purchase, we now have the whole process information available. So in the end, let's say 20 years ago, we only had uh, hundreds of gigabytes of data, which is still a lot of data, but limited. And now we have terabytes of data, and even some companies go up to petabytes of data because of, uh, let's say, the intermediate processes that go on. Uh, these companies, they can observe every tweet you send out about their company. And so this, sending out this tweet may reveal something of your thought processes 
uh, that brought you to either buy or discard uh, a certain product. Now, this is, let's say, just observing what we, what we do as consumers, but there is more to that, of course. Uh, we are not always rational consumers. We, uh, you also want to tap into, let's say, the attitude a consumer has towards a brand. And so, in addition to the existing data, we also collect additional survey data, and we try to augment the existing data with what people think about products. And so nowadays, there's a, let's say, a big stream of research that combines the behavioral side of things with the attitudinal side of things. And the combination of both should give us, let's say, more insight into why people purchase certain products. Well, now we know uh, what your all, well, more or less, <laughs> uh, what your research is. It's quite a diverse, um, diverse field, uh, I would say. Um, at this moment, what do you do with the data? Is it in your institution that this data is archived and curated? Do you do it yourself, or do you use a general a disciplinary bank? I'll start with you, Louis. Um, <coughs> well, for my part, the humanities, I, I, I should distinguish, I guess, history and literature research from several other types of humanities research that are all also going on. But speaking from, for that part of the humanities and for my institution, um, the situation is that we don't, don't publish our core data, really. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have that. Uh, for example, if, if I run analysis, I get statistical data. And I do keep that, and um, uh, sure, I'm, I'm prepared to, uh, to deposit that with the, the Dutch National uh, Data Archive, DOMS. Mm -hmm. Um, but the fact is that we're not very much educating and, and um, instilling this idea of, of uh, data curation and data stewardship into humanities researchers. I think we could do better at that, that mm -hmm. job, actually. There is, however, a complicated uh, complication. Complication is <laughs> always complicated, I guess. It's that um, for the humanities, uh, for, for literary and history, uh, history scholars, um, it's still quite unclear what their data actually is. Um, of course, yeah. we all use text, we all use documents, but what, what is text, what is a document? If you start asking a humanities researcher what he defines as data, you get a, a different, distinctly different answer from, for every humanities researcher. Mm -hmm. And the trouble with humanities data is that it's highly complex and it's high, highly, highly varied highly heterogeneous. Um, so we, we, we feel like uh, people in the linguistics side of research have a distinct advantage over us because they tend to use spoken word and written word language and they tend to use to look at the string, at the characters yeah. or the phonology, uh, which, and I don't want to downplay their research at all here, but uh, from a humanities, from a literary uh, or historian's perspective, that is a very baseline kind of data, which is very, very much uh, um, uh, uh, possible, it's very much storageable, it's very clear, it's uh, very, very common. Mm -hmm. uh, now, now take the research of a plain vanilla average humanities researcher, and he has uh, tens, uh, maybe hundreds different documents, different images, different interviews, uh, various languages, uh, various <coughs> compositions that are meaningful to him or her. And there is not really a way yet to express that richness and complexity. Sure, there's a semantic web, uh, but that is still not really sort of close to what we as, as humanities researchers need from data modeling and data representation, I think. But is that a question of data def definition? What is data, or is it a question of uh, a good ways to describe the data? Uh, I, I would tend to a lot, actually. But also, uh, we're, we're, we're only grappling at the bottom, I think, of formalizing the way we do research in the humanities. Mm -hmm. and, and that word alone triggers um, mighty negative responses, actually, if you talk to a human humanities researcher about formalization. So you just ask questions about how do you do your research? You tend to run in this wall of, well, 
my research is so specific and mm -hmm. so much tied to interpretation that it's not formalized. I think this is sort of a somewhat easy fallacy that humanities researchers use to sort of uh, not enter into yeah. real, try, really trying to establish a formalization about research, which is possible. Yeah. But at the same time, we need to, the, the computer science side of things uh, needs to, and is in fact, trying to come up with ways of supporting this vague and inconcrete and subtle reasoning that humanities researchers are using. Because we're not, we're in fact not about mathematics, we're not about counting, right. we're about reasoning. Mm -hmm. And there's ways to support that, but that's also in development. So on the one hand, we're figuring out what our data is and how to represent it. On yeah. the other hand, we're trying to come up with the ways you can computationally approach this data. So it's research on both sides. So we're not way near, I think, uh, generalized infrastructure for these kinds of research, yeah. but we're hopefully getting there. But at this moment, this is stored all on your own servers in your own institute. Uh, currently, like that. yes, yeah. I'm afraid yeah. it is. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, well, in 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 biology and and well, the kind of data we're focusing on, it, it's really quite different. It's really straightforward what we're looking for in terms of data. It's. Uh, 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 Primary biodiversity data is also termed as the what, where, and by whom has a certain species been observed. And, and it's there are standards for this, so this is not really the problem. <laughs> now, uh, I'll go a little bit into detail in, in what kind of, of different uh, types of data or, or, or sources of data we're targeting. And one is, for instance, museum collections. Um, another one is, is like monitoring data, like in, in, in the, the frame of the water framework directive where, where member states of the EU have to report the water quality based on which organisms occur. And the other one is more the, the experimental, the, the, the ad hoc um, sampling done by researchers. And each of these three have their own pe uh, peculiarities. And the, for museum collections, it's clear museums have an obligation. They're starting to digitize their collections, and they have an obligation to make their public. They have a public role. And so, well, most of those institutions actually make their data available, and this is kind of done through a network, what's what we call an, a network of interoperable databases, and, and they make their data available. So. Actually, the, the data physically is, is on a server from the museum, but it's, it's made available through uh, open standards. It, it can be harvested through uh, a central initiative. And in, in my case, this is the, called the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. And um, for monitoring data, what there's, there's more, um, let's say, we, we have in the Biofresh project, try to to mobilize this kind of data, and there it's it's a, a problem of of political will, willingness, where where we really see okay those data are out there, um, but people are seem reluctant to share this data because okay if you could, based on this original raw data, people could re recalculate. The, the, the quality index and, and criticize this, this kind of thing. And then it becomes more a political thing and certain member states don't, don't uh, uh, have any trouble of sharing this data. Others are like, okay, but the quality is maybe not good enough. They, they, don't, they distrust. That is what you see in the Biofresh pro project. Mm -hmm. you, you stumble upon that obstacle that yeah. not everyone is willing to share yeah. and that a data quality yeah. Uh, question is yeah. an issue there. Yeah. And, and then, well, you have, have the, the, the researchers themselves, and then you, you, you run into different stories again, like, okay, I, I don't get enough credit for, for uh, this is the, the presentation by Sarah Callahan. Yeah. It, it summarized the situation there very much, I think. So we, I we have the whole range of... <laughs> <laughs> everything in place. Do you think it's necessary? How do the peers react in the project? 
do they force each other or really demand to open up the data or to make it available somewhere for sharing? So, uh, well, the nice thing within our project is indeed that we have the researchers in the project. Mm. They, they have their own data and, well, in because we, we're a project that's supposed to show off how you can make this data available. They, ha they are under a certain pressure, but even there, there's, it's still now we're running in, into the third year, uh, of, uh, fourth year, the last year of our project, and still a lot of this data set, that we still need to, to really get it fro from the researchers within our own project. So there's a, a long way to go. Long way to go. <laughs> What's your experience with that? Yeah. Yeah, so given that we are working with highly sensitive data, uh, I think most of us wouldn't like our purchases being thrown sure. on the internet. Uh, so it is a very, very sensitive topic in our field. But we have to archive it. Uh, absolutely. And um, so we have to sign lots and lots of uh, non disclosure agreements. So NDAs are really a pain mm -hmm. in our uh, line of business, but that's the way it is. Um, of course, you could argue, why don't you anonymize uh, data sets? And to some extent, you can do so. But uh, even doing that is really tricky because there's always this one data source that is external to your data that could augment your data in such a way that you could actually identify who is behind the data. So we have to be extremely careful but still, it is an imp a very important uh, issue, actually even uh, that important that uh, one of the leading journals in our field, uh, the Marketing Science Journal, uh, actually they published in their editorial uh, of January, February uh, 2013, so uh, this year, about um, a new policy they put in place that you have to share the data with them. But even more so, not just the data, the raw data, but also the programs you used to uh, validate the results. And so, so you're already there, you have the question in front of you. Absolutely, and so th there's a push towards this openness, and I'm very much in favor of that because we're also doing lots of open source software development, so uh, we actually support that, but all, even though our companies that fund us don't support uh, that part. Uh, but it is, uh, there is a big push towards this. Um, the, the open question is, will it happen? Because even this journal, if you read the editorial, so they put in a mandatory process, but at the end they say, you may apply for exemptions. Yeah. But, it, it, but oh, but op when we talk about openness, we can't avoid it. There are mm -hmm. some data that we cannot put out in the open, but we have to make sure that it's somewhere safe and it can be repeated, that it can be curated. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have help in your universities on that front from your university, or do you say we need absolute, or your uh, institution, or do you say we really need a more national approach, or we need every library to step in and help us on this subject? What is your feeling about I understand your question correct that you're asking whether we have sufficient help and support in opening our data? No, or it's, it's as well the archiving and curating, so uh, it doesn't have to be open then, uh, but in both, in both sense, because when you want to have data out in the open, you also have to make sure that it stays open and that you curate it, that you archive it. But some data will nev well, not quickly be open because it's too sensitive. I can imagine, I, yeah, I, but it's both. I, yes, and I can, I, there's lots to be said about that, I guess, but let me give you two <laughs> things that I think are, are pointers or could be important, at least for the humanities side of things. Uh, first, there's, uh, again, there's wh what is our data? I mean, if it's, if it's journal articles, I think the situation is sort of under control in the sense that we can publish these and libraries are doing their jobs and so these get stored and, and archived and preserved and opened and discoverable. So that's, that's, that's something we, we trust in, as it were. 
But then there's the, the sort of digital born data, the data that gets created while doing your research. And this is very much, we're now experiencing sort of a, a not a full switch, but at least the humanities research is augmented with this idea of open, uh, open science approaches indeed. So where your data is being produced some, sometimes by crowdsourcing, uh, and also the, uh, the research uh, process itself is much more open, uh, coll collaborative. Uh, and it also means that, for example, in the case of digital editions, these might not be closed down anytime soon. So it's, it might not be done at some point. So how do we cope with this data that gets updated every time and time and, and yeah, again? Yeah, like versioning and things like versioning, that. Versioning, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so these are very much difficult problems we're still struggling with, and yes, we certainly could use the help of libraries and archives there. Now, there's the thing about open, open data, open access data, apart from some things that you can't disclose for ethical reasons, of course. Um, I think that the, the big trouble there is that everybody, ev no researcher will deny the, use, the usefulness of open data. And usually within the humanities, it's not very sensitive data in the sense that, oh, somebody will scoop my research. So that's not a very big issue. But what a big issue is, is crediting. The people creating this data and creating data sets and uh, opening up data, publishing data online digitally, are usually never academically credited for doing so. And this is- So this you say there, there should be a policy initiative there because I'm not, I'm, not sure, I, I'm not sure how we should implement that policy yes. actually, but indeed. I don't say <laughs> top down, but I mean somewhere there must be yes, a policy that There's def definitely an uh, urgent need for crediting, just you know, creating data, creating data set, publishing data. Uh, if, we, if we don't sort of, uh, if, if we keep uh, um, uh, only crediting monographs and, and journal articles, uh, open access data will not very soon happen, not even if you are um, increasingly, this, this is yeah. just a demand from your funders. Uh, yeah, but I even think so, yeah. there's no good stewardship in uh, pressing people into it alone. Yeah, lots of research is, is, is done now on, on that level. How can other means of assessment also in opening up data and uh, how data publications and, and, and things like that, it's exactly. absolutely sure. I want to ask you that you, you have a really big, uh, well, rather big, big data sets. Uh, I was thinking about the petabytes as something else, but it really, it, it, it's a big data set. Mm -hmm. How many versions, uh, do, do you version the data? Or, uh, how do you want to preserve them? Uh, how do you want to keep them? Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually a very big issue in our field because um, the other thing is that uh, we do modeling on the data. so. We do not just describe what's in the data, we actually try to figure out causal relationships. So we, uh, we hope in the data there are some natural experiments uh, where, for example, uh, prices were lower at certain point in, in time in the supermarket and at other points in time they were higher. And we, use, we try to use these differences to, to infer what price is doing whether a lower price actually helps us in, in buying more. So this is just one example. We have this for many, many, for example, uh, on in how many uh, supermarkets physically is my product available? So what's the distribution coverage uh, in, my, in my distribution channel? So there are many, many aspects to this. And moreover, we need to version the data so that we can do out of period predictions. Because we are not just in business of describing data, but what we really wanna do is we wanna predict your behavior and we wanna use these predictions to optimize our company policies. And so that's a third layer. So we really need different versions of our data, uh, so different histories, so that we can go back how did we build models on last year's data and then we use them to predict next year and then we verify did it happen what we predicted so 
And do you feel that uh, you can cope with that now? Or is it, this is really a struggle at the moment? What is the help that you expect? Uh, good question. Currently, we cope with it ourselves, but it's a, it puts a big burden on the PhD students and our, on our department to deal with these uh, elements. Um, and you almost need a, an IT background to be able to cope with these. Uh, so, uh, let's say, help from libraries or IT departments would very much be appreciated uh, to do that. Uh, because, of course, uh, uh, massaging your data uh, takes a lot of time. People forget that uh, it's almost 80 to 90 percent of the time of a PhD researcher preparing a data set. So That's what Sarah uh, was showing Absolutely. To, yeah. mm. And so nobody credits that. Uh, but in our field it's a little different because yeah. uh, it's usually the PhD student who actually publishes it that actually also uh, prepares the data. So to some extent, they get credited uh, for their work, uh, but we forget that it is most of the, most of the time involved uh, of the whole process. But, uh, it's uh, absolutely so that you need help from the libraries, but we have, I think we have to work together to, to get the right frame. Which data do we, uh, do we need to collect? Uh, how is it described? Uh, I don't know. We don't have that much time anymore. I really want to know, uh, what do you think in the audience? What, uh, what, what would you like to ask the, the scientists? What information do you need to help them? Uh, what pops up in your mind? Anyone having a remark or a question on that side? No one? <laughs> yes, Kev. I just wonder what do you wish your libraries and more generally your universities were doing for you that they aren't doing at the moment that would make, that I guess would allow you to concentrate on doing the research and not doing what you see as the things that distract you from the research? Yeah. Well, um, <coughs> I, I understand that libraries are, are very much uh, connected to this institutional archiving efforts. And I think there, there's various needs for, for encouraging scientists to really deposit their data as well. Not only the paper, but also uh, uh, the data. And, and there's various initiatives. There's uh, initiatives at the level of the funding agency uh, where they, they require depositing data there's uh, a, a need from the uh, a requirement from the journals, like for instance, working with Dry It, on which we will have a presentation this afternoon, I guess. And I, I think that the, the uh, libraries could play a role in, on one hand, together with this uh, uh, institutional archives to push forward for, for this archiving of the data itself. Um, in as in as a well, link in the whole chain, and um, <coughs> well, I, I'm lost here. <laughs> okay, but it's a uh, very important. Yeah, well, I would like to answer two things to that at least. Um, there's lots more probably. Uh, uh, first of all, um, if if you ask any humanities researcher what what is the data you want, what's the information that you want, simply get me all text, world round. Uh, in the same format, exchangeable. Um, it sounds simple. Actually, it is pretty simple, but it's a hard job doing that. Uh, but what specifically lacks, uh, but although it's coming more and more, becoming more and more fashionable, I guess, is API access to that textual data. Uh, so a means for my servers, for my algorithm, to travel to your servers and parse or uh, analyze the data that you have available uh, from your collections of text. Now, uh, of course, I'm, I'm text oriented, so there will be uh, similar questions from the perspective of get me all the pictures you have, or et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that, that's a very machine, uh, machine access to the data is very important, and it's, it's still very, uh, very obscure, actually, at the moment. 
Uh, the other thing what I would like to do and would I, would, would I, I would be very much interested in is small scope, small scale projects together with libraries, librarians, to figure out what actually, because it sounds simple, you know, machine access, what does that mean? Uh, but as if, if you go into really doing research and you discover that there's all kinds of workflows and uh, description uh, problematics uh, that you want to get solved, and we need far and far more information on actually doing that. And I think this is not by, the way we gain this information, this knowledge, is not by doing some grand, broad, European-wide, one-off project, but by a multitude of small projects with specific libraries and specific research questions so that we can accumulate that knowledge on how humanities research should actually access that information. So go into your institution, talk to uh, a scientist or uh, with a group of scientists and determine what uh, the specific needs are and how they can be uh, how it picked up in a workflow with standards and protocols that are uh, more general. Yeah. Can I add to that? I, I would definitely encourage all of you to not just think about the data, also think about how people process the data. Workflows. And so the workflow is even more important maybe than the data because maybe the data you can recollect uh, if something uh, is lost. But uh, imagine, uh, for example, the, the case that we saw a few months ago or a few weeks ago of these two Harvard professors uh, that did a, a very famous study on austerity and they, their in conclusions have been used by our political leaders, but it turned out that they made a small mistake in their Excel analysis. They excluded six data points and these were six outlying data points that made sure that the conclusions were, some would argue, wrong, other would say, yeah, would, <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> the importance of the process and the programs and the code is, is as important as the original data. Yeah. Ivan, you wanted to say uh, something? Just, just a small addition. Um, so linked to the, the role of libraries, linked to the institutional archives, I, I believe there's, there's an important role in terms of guiding researchers towards uh, certain repositories. Let's say they have this type of data. Okay, this, this would be the, the best fit for your data to, to deposit. And I think there's a, could be an important role for the library. And scientists would accept that from us librarians. Well, yeah, but it's, it's a valid question. Sometimes they don't, sometimes they will. You would, exp uh, you would accept that. It, it's like, okay, it's uh, this institutional archives itself, they're not too popular, I would think, uh, in general, but it's something they have to, to do with. And if, if, if it's, uh, if, if at that stage you can offer them some help, some guidance, I think it's welcome, a okay. welcome addition. <laughs> Thank you. I have to end here, I'm afraid. Let's talk more uh, at uh, lunchtime, but I'm afraid I have to uh, break it off here. Thank you very much.